I want to talk about some, some other diseases, uh, you know, beyond the approved indications. Uh, and we have some very exciting, I think, preliminary data uh, that you know, we hope to see more about this weekend uh, in, in the setting of, of myeloma and AML. Uh, and, and I think I'd like to talk about future directions. So David, you want to talk about uh, you know, targeting of, of BCMA, uh, the B-cell maturation antigen, which is very exciting. Yeah. Well, so yeah, so BCMA is a, is a target that expressed on plasma cells in, in many cases of multiple myeloma. And we're starting to see uh, exciting results uh, from several different companies and groups uh, targeting this. And I think there's four or five abstracts at the meeting uh, to, using these approaches, which in some cases can induce stringent CRs in, in patients with quite uh, refractory multiple myeloma. Obviously, multiple myeloma is a disease where we have a lot of drugs, um, but they none of them are potentially really curative. And we're starting to see that when people run out of options, they they don't have many other places to go. So it's very exciting to see this. I'm actually fascinated by the fact that we still see cytokine release syndrome and neurotoxicity now with a different, totally different CAR target. So it's not just CD19 or you know CD20 that's that's resulting in this. This seems to be a um, specific toxicity, especially the neurotoxicity that's related to encounter with antigen. Um, you know, we're we're be just beginning our BCMA trials, and I know many groups uh, have experience. Uh, it seems to be quite varied. The, 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 the follow-up was short thus far, but um, we've seen response rates in the you know 50 to 100 percent range. But we really need to see you know real data on that in terms of stringency of those complete remissions. Are they really immunofixation negative? You know, um, and I think it's but it's really really encouraging. Steve, you know, um, in, in some ways, if you look at older adults with, for example, low-grade lymphomas mm -hmm. and myeloma, you know, mm -hmm. median age of myeloma diagnosis is 68. Mm -hmm. Many patients will respond, for example, with follicular lymphoma, but yep. it's not a durable yep. response, I mean, so there's some parallels yeah, here. Yeah, there's, there's clearly bad actors with follicular lymphoma. It, it, many patients don't even need to be treated, but there's a subset of patients that are bad at the get-go, and then there's a subset of patients that are bad at the end of their disease. And we've studied a group of patients like that and uh, using the same CD19-directed CAR, Tisagen Leclusal, that we did, we used for diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. And there we actually got a 71% uh, CR rate with a duration of remission the same as, as we got with the large cell patients. We haven't reached the median at, you know, uh, beyond around two and a half years of follow-up. So what the challenge, I think, with those low-grade lymphoma patients is you have a therapy, lots of things work, Lots of things result in response. They're not curative. Uh, and in myeloma, we have phenomenal number of agents, proteasome <laughs> yeah, inhibitors, yeah, yeah. and deratumumab has, has obviously had you know, phenomenal results in using, uh, being moved up earlier. We have quadruplets now, rather than just triplets that were just the standard a short while ago. And now we have cars with remarkable efficacy, but unknown durability of response in an older population. So how do we put all these data together and how are trials going well, to get with designed? With regard to low-grade lymphoma, I think the most important thing to remember is not everybody needs to be treated. What about myeloma? <laughs> and you'll get the best results treating patients that don't need treatment, okay? <laughs> so, so myeloma, they do need to be treated. Yeah, they do no. need to be treated. How do you, yeah. how do you I, put a I, car I think, in, in, a, in the setting of a, a wonderful range, uh, you know, range well, of upfront therapy? I think the thing about myeloma, just like, it's just like lymphoma, right? You start off in a population that is kind of into the road, we've used up all your options, and then you show safety, you show some uh, activity, and then you start moving it up based on those results. I mean, I think that there's, there are some challenges with BCMA. Yeah. Um, the antigen is shed. It come, it's, it's cleaved and comes off of the cell surface. We're already starting to show, uh, see in the, in the reports that in resistant cells, the BCMA level is lower. So there's probably um, uh, shedding and, and loss of the antigen that's going to be a problem. And that, but that also then opens up avenues to prevent the cleavage of the BCMA from the cells. And there's already plans for combination studies to try to do that. And so there, I think there's a lot of ways to go forward. Obviously, we're probably not going to be treating 90-year-olds with myeloma, so this will very likely start off in the younger population that that have the most the, the most severe disease that's resistant to all all treatments. But it, once you get once you get some proof of concept, which we're now seeing, then it opens the avenues to move this up. up yeah, I, I agree exactly with what David's saying because you know you may have a, a plethora of drugs that are active in myeloma, and the average lifespan is now about eight years from diagnosis. Um, you know, these people have to live continuously on medicines that have a lot of side effects. The myeloma uh, agents have a lot of side effects. So, so I think if you could have a single treatment that even buys you a durable a remission of a, a, a of a significant duration, where you're not on one drug after another, that's a 
benefit in terms of quality of life. No, I agree, and I think the other thing I would add is that in myeloma, in terms of approval, we, we, you know, we looked at overall survival first, and then we moved now to the standard being progression-free survival, and I think a lot of people are now talking about the ability to achieve uh, astringent CR, right. right? So I think that if we have an early endpoint that's a surrogate for that long-term survival, and it could be that we're gonna be looking at whether a quadruplet or whether a CAR T cell results in that stringent CR at a measured earlier time point. We haven't proven that yet, but. But I think initially we're gonna to have to study it in as these really refractory patients. Right. And, and the comparisons are obviously very difficult. What do you, what do you compare to? But I think no, no one will disagree that in this population that's really, really bad and failed all of those agents, that w this is an advantage. So, well, I think you know Jim Kokendorfer developed uh, at the NCI developed the first BCMA targeted CAR, um, Bluebird, and and then uh, and then a, a Chinese company Nanjing have have had some pretty impressive results yeah, that the are being results reported appear, at uh, this I mean, meeting. Almost and, too good to be true. I mean, well, really and, exciting. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and 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 I have to tell you that I was uh, in uh, in a hospital in, in China that at that institution had treated 40 patients actually with CD19 CARs uh, for for lymphoma. So the the Chinese experience actually is. Uh, impressive in some areas, and, and I think that we have to look at what those results will be, especially I think at this meeting, there'll be more uh, results with longer endpoints. Well, I think Steve said it. I mean, these the costs of these other drugs are not cheap, not right? Cheap. And if you're on lenalidomide and you know all these all these drugs for years and years at a tremendous part, uh, cost, it, it might be cheaper to give a financial car toxicity <laughs> as well yeah. as as so, well as side effects. So who knows? Maybe the future yeah. will be just give a car early on, and you know. It's certainly possible, or we could end up in like the auto transplant situation for myeloma, where we have uh, combination induction and then some consolidative therapy, whether it be an auto transplant or, or car, and then some maintenance. So it may be that that we don't replace things, but we place something in sequence, which yeah, might increase likely. costs, not decrease them. So we'll have to see.